system goes back to my teens. So I'm not going to go right through that. Let's just say that I was one of the people in Ireland who worked on women's rights at a legislative level in the late 1960s, because women did not at that time in Ireland have full civil rights. But I have always been an activist at one level or another. I became a food activist in the 1990s through working as an interpreter with the Via Campesina as a voluntary interpreter. And that led me into finding urgency, which really matched the work that I was doing professionally on social and solidarity economy, as well as with food. And when I became involved with urgency, which would have been in about 2007, thereabouts, there was nobody doing advocacy. So it struck me that this was something of a need and being something of a natural loud mouth and uh, wanting to really move the logic of local solidarity partnerships between producers and consumers forward, I became involved and became the first advocacy person within urgency and then moved on to become part of the original civil society mechanism for the first four-year mandate, which I then passed on to Isa. And she's taken it so much further than I ever could have. But I continue to work in advocacy, not just within urgency, but also within the social and solidarity economy movement which at global level is represented by RIPES, the Réseau Intercontinental pour la Promotion de l'Économie Sociale et Solidaire, where I'm one of the joint coordinators at global level, but with a special food sovereignty hat. So advocating to try and build the bridge between social and solidarity economy and food sovereignty and CSA and LSPAs in particular. So that's really a potted history. <laughs> it's not long, but uh, yeah, it starts also in 90s, but I, I won't explain everything. Uh, but I think my I started yeah, in, yeah, uh, with local movements, with uh, food sovereignty movement. And I think we we started doing things, I don't know how to, <laughs> and starting to, to build relationship with, uh, between rural and urban areas, I think was our beginning here. And, and with the time you realize that, okay, you can do a lot of work, uh, linking people, but it's not enough because the framework that we have and the, yeah, the, the public policy and the, yeah, there is the framework that we have and we need to move that too because it's not enough because we we have a world uh, that we have to, to change. So, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, from these small movements and small groups, we are starting to to articulate some networks here. I, I'm based in the Basque Country here in, in then not in Spain, but for the moment, I think we have to say it. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and uh, after that, I I was working for some years for uh, Vizcaya, that is part of La Via Campesina, and I was there coordinating the the CSA network, and it's how I met uh, Urgency. So yeah, when I when I met Urgency, the advocacy work like, was like, wow, <laughs> hello. <laughs> and uh, because it, uh, um, yeah, until that moment I, I was working at local level and then 
I started to have more international um, view and work also. And yeah, and we and I think with uh, the last years for me um, has been the challenge for for me at least here is to with advocacy uh, not only is to to make us visible, no to to show that uh, it's not that we need another world; the other world exists. So and yeah, not only for people, also for public policy. So yeah. And I think it's enough. <laughs> okay, uh, like really quickly, um, I'm working um, in France, uh, in the Paris region on CSA networks. And uh, currently I'm working on, I uh, advocate on the, on a new law in France on generation renewal. And so I'm experimenting advocacy at the national level from a CSA perspective. And today I will facilitate and uh, ask some questions to Isa and Judith on how they advocate in at the European level and what can be done. Uh, so if it's fine, I can start. Um, so maybe my first question will be, so what happens with our food systems now and um, how European institutions uh, have an impact on our food systems? And uh, like in other words, um, who really decides what we can eat in a, on a daily basis? And it's a bit broad, but it will be the, the beginning of a further question. So maybe Isa, would you like to, to start? Yeah, or maybe Judith, you want to go ahead? Yeah, okay. <laughs> there was a really, really interesting article in the Guardian newspaper yesterday. And for the first time, there's a really clear article about the damage that ultra-processed foods are doing to our health. And ultra-processed foods are what... 60, 70% of people are eating all the time. They're what are causing all the non-communicable diseases like diabetes, obesity, cardiac issues, and so on. And what is happening to our food system, to answer the question, is really the complete takeover of the food and agriculture system by the agribusiness, by technology, and this will soon include unlabeled new breeding techniques unless we're very vigilant. So that is, I would say, the dominant agri-food business trend. And the counterbalance to that, of course, is the movement of which we are part. It is the food sovereignty movement the right of people to dis determine what they want to eat, the right of peasant agriculture to access the land, to continue to use peasant seeds, traditional seeds, and the right to a healthy life and social protection for both the producers and the eaters. It's all further aggravated by, and compounded by a number of factors, such as the climate crisis, the cost of living crisis. <laughs> Uh, sorry, Judith, we don't really hear you. But what is happening to the food is something that we need to fight as much as fast and as hard as we have it. Sorry, Judith, could you repeat? Hello? Like a... Yeah, Hello? sorry. Bad connection. What do you want me to repeat? Like the like four sentences before. So... <laughs> Basically, what is happening to the food system 
is the responsibility of the global agri-food business, and it is compounded by the various different crises, the climate crises, the conflicts, and the cost of living crises. And we need to fight all of this together with other social movements in a joined up holistic way. Yeah, only to, to complete that, uh, what you said. Um, yeah, I think that uh, what happens is that we are part of the global world. <clears throat> and as part of it, uh, we see how the, um, the states and how the European Union <clears throat> um, uh, the put um, yeah the center of our uh, food systems are not the people are uh, is the market no is the the center we the the main goal is to to feed a market not to feed the people <laughs> so this is the main problem that that we have no and um, and the the policies are focused more on on this. Um, and the result is that we have, okay, we are a part of this, the global north, and it's supposed that we are in the good part of, <laughs> of the world. And of course, we are better than than others, but uh, even in the in some states, for example, in, in Spain, we have more than 20% of people that have problem to, to get food because they don't have enough uh, resources or they have low income, so they have many problems. No, we have a public procurement that is not uh, putting our right to food uh, as a priority uh, here. At least I, we know that this is changing in in some parts of the European Union, but still we have a lot of work because I think that we are losing the not only in europe but uh, we see it also at global level the the right perspective uh we we and here in european union we have the the narrative of sustainability <laughs> and uh, but it's a sustainability that nobody defines so it's everything is sustainable and nothing is sustainable so i think <laughs> now maybe this is one of the main challenges that we have but we can um yeah talk about this maybe later and uh, so do you see the the cap as a as a tool to to change that or do you see other like political processes in at the european level that uh, uh like produce some changes who are you addressing your question to, Ariel? Both of you, but uh, uh, like I was answering to Isa, so maybe Isa, if you want to pursue, but. Uh... Yeah, I can start and Judith, please. <laughs> um, yeah, because I think the, the CAP is a tool that uh, European Union created for, at, at the beginning for our food security. Uh, and it was not a bad idea. Uh, but <laughs> the point is again the the center of the of the cap. No, if the center and the priority um, can be uh, feed the people, ensure that we have peasants, we have a uh, healthy food, we have yeah. If the priority can be that, it's a tool. But the point is that that now uh we don't see that this is the the priority we see we see that the priorities are others uh because we are part of this global market and the market is the center you know, of the of the cap so the money is going the public money is going to is, is yeah it uh, goes to to feed the market because the okay the peasants uh and the farmers receive uh, money but uh, this money is only to to be more how is it uh, competent uh, in the market uh, and is the reality is that this not to to help uh, the farmers is to help the market you no know, and to maintain uh, the market alive you no know, not and and while we are maintaining the market alive 
we are killing the farmers. So uh, this is the result that we are uh, having with the, the cap that we have now, but we could have another cap. It's not, I think it's not impossible. And there are some platforms working for, for it and showing that we can have other models. Because, and, and yeah, this is the tool that we have. And of course we are having now um, other processes that I want to to be maybe complement um, as farm to fork process and this is part of this course also um, but the point is that the public policies are super um, how is it um, um, yeah under the cap so uh, and the cap is the I don't know <laughs> the religion in, in Europe so and the other processes uh, are complement are a, a complement, but the center is the is the cap. No, but I think we need to fight for a a cap that put people at uh, the center of of the system. Could I add to that maybe a little bit? Because while we had secured some fairly positive aspects in the farm to fork and in the green deal in terms of policy. The war in Ukraine has had a devastating impact on anything that was remotely positive. Within CAP, there is now a move to roll back any progress to remove the land that was set aside to lie fallow to remove the land that was set aside for biodiversity in order to increase productivity, which goes completely along with what Isa was saying about the market, and also to increase use of pesticides again and chemical fertilizers. In fact, the war in Ukraine is an excuse that is being used by the agribusiness lobby to roll back anything remotely positive that we have managed to secure in the last five to 10 years, including in the farm to fork. It is also being used as an excuse to increase productivity through new breeding techniques. And these are all just fake arguments the alternative could have and should have been to introduce massive agroecology support and to switch from conventional farming with cap support to agroecology. And this hasn't happened. Also, it's really important to note that until now, the cap has only provided funding for farms of a certain size and herds of animals of a certain size. So that small peasant agriculture farmers who are growing vegetables for local consumption or producing meat or milk or dairy or honey or fruit for local consumption through CSAs has never really entered into the cap dynamics. So that CAP is something that has largely not affected any of the producers working in our European networks and is unlikely to have much positive impact on them unless it is very radically changed. And that is not happening. And uh, so what are the effects on the European food sovereignty, uh, Judith? Uh, is there any effects? I think the effects on European food sovereignty are the same as on global food sovereignty. You're looking at global markets and European markets. And with the same implications, with FAO supporting long food chains, the European Union has tried through the farm to fork and some enlightened MEPs to support short food so there is an 
we are, we are living in today. Sorry, is still present, not as much as it was. I'd also add. <clears throat> Can you hear Sorry, me? can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. You yeah, can... I can hear you. Perfect. You can continue. Okay. So the the impact is really national or even local government legislation. For example, in France, food plans. Now, this is part of the way in which we are responding and can continue to respond. The other important aspect is to create allies, both within local government, within the European Economic and Social Council, and in terms of MEPs. And those three levels are vitally important to defend the land for farming and for farm use, as well as to defend producing healthy, nutritious local food for people right across Europe and Central Asia. Uh, Isa, would you like to to make more specification on, on the food sovereignty and on the, the rule of cap? Yeah, I think at least here, the the main result, um, but result is the the land grabbing that we are having now because the, the cap, um, yeah, uh, the priority of the cap is the, the extension of, of the land. So yeah, uh, people are the big uh, owners are uh, buy more and more uh, land, and we have um, yeah the land in few hands uh, because the small uh, farmers are disappearing and they are leaving. So yeah, and uh, yeah, we have this uh, and. Um, yeah, and, and also the 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 long chains of of the yeah the, um, in, uh, within the the food channels because this as I said before the the cap is for is is feeding the the long chains no and the the global market so it's not for our short uh, chains um, yeah you say that yeah I think that here we have. Some small farmers that okay they perceive they, they receive some money or uh, from cap but as they are very small they have the the only and I think it's not a good the good point is that they uh, they have no uh, dependency from cap that this is the, the one of the main results that a lot of people is really are really depending on the subsidies of of cap. No, uh, in the livestock uh, here with milk and other productions, they are really depending on, on the subsidies and they are slaves of the industry uh, and they are disappearing because they are totally broke. So, um, and they are living and these lands are for big owners that they are receiving money and money from, from CAP. So yeah, I think the challenge is to change this and the the only things that we that that I don't know can be positive in the last uh, cap are not for change are only to how to say to decorate <laughs> the, the 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 framework no but not to change it. Thanks and uh, Judith, you talked about a bit about allies. Um, so first. How do we work as an international CSA network on advocacy at the European level? And what are like the best spaces according to you? And well, yeah, first questions, and then we, I will ask more questions about advocacy at the European level. But allies first and um, spaces as a CSA network. Okay, the two are very closely linked. In terms of allies, 
Obviously, urgency identifies as a social movement, which means values. Human rights, the right to food in particular, but also other human rights. Our closest allies have been the Via Campesina, but also the Fishers Network, the Pastoralist Network, the Indigenous Peoples Network. And we come together through the International Planning Committee for Food Sovereignty, which is based in Rome, which is global, but which is declined as Nieleni Europe and Central Asia. And there we collectively work as constituency representatives, where urgency represents the consumer constituency, to work on policy for FAO Europe and Central Asia, because FAO is not just a UN agency, it is both present in a Europe and Central Asia central office in Budapest and also at country level. Um, we always work together with our allies. We are also deeply allied with the social solidarity economy movement as another alliance and bringing all of that together through the Nieleni perspective is really part of where we are going right now. And Isa, would you like to complete? Or I can ask more questions to, to Judith about her concrete experiences. So no, only to to complete that that, that I think that um sometimes we we work at different levels and uh, we don't know it because <laughs> uh, because for example at local level we are uh, we are not uh, articulated only at European level because uh, as social movement we have partners in different states and for example here in Spain okay uh, we we are part of urgency but at local level we are very linked with other movements for climate change for other movements that maybe are not linked with us as urgency and this and their european uh, movement but at local level we are working together so it's a multi-level i don't know how to say uh but we i think that uh, yeah we we have very clear that we we cannot go alone to anywhere. Uh, we need allies because we only together we we can change anything. And uh, yeah, I think we we work at different levels and in different spaces. And I think that that general uh, we from a general overview uh, in different. Uh, uh, how to say it, local levels. Uh, it's been very interesting. The um, the yeah the links that we are having with for example with feminist movement or with uh, people that with young people that are working a lot with uh, against the climate change and uh and we are uh, we need to we are working together in some spaces but we need more and more no uh maybe not at european level but yes uh yeah on the the ground <laughs> uh we and we are working on it no i think it's interesting also. could i just add to that a little bit i totally agree with what you've said isa i think that we're really not strong enough to work alone and do anything alone ever and in terms of the european space the food policy coalition is the space where we have worked collectively with other social movements, but also some NGOs to actually work on policy line by line, clause by clause, because at a certain moment, policy means sitting down and working on legally binding or not texts. And that is really a very long, very painstaking, very difficult, Sorry, 
sorry to do this again. You get the work and you collectively put it together. A good policy coalition, which will create that good policy which was created originally by Olivier de Schutter through IPES Food, is the space. Sorry, my internet is really unstable. I know. I don't know why. Um, but it is the space that we have used until now. And I think it is the best space for us to work. Nevertheless, working with individual MEPs who we happen to know or, or members of the European Union, we also have very strong allies, is very important. Okay, I think we lost the end of your uh, yeah, the ends of your um, sentences. Um, but maybe like in, in could you uh, specific give us an example of at concrete achievements uh, within these spaces? Maybe you have an example, like a, like a rewarding during um, uh, European legislation processes um, with allies or fruitful allies alliances. So do you have like example of achievements? Oh, we lost it. <laughs> okay. But maybe, Isa, you have some example, <laughs> concrete example. Uh, maybe I can share, uh, do you have more uh, information than me? But yeah, for example, the, the process on food systems uh, law that we have now, um, we have been engaged. Uh, we have no, sometimes we have no the capacity to follow everything because we are, we are a social movement. We, we don't have super, um, we have super staff, but not many people as staff. Uh, and uh, yeah, but we try to to be engaged in, in different uh, processes. And I think that also the, the projects that we have with uh, other allies is our tools to maybe not to be super uh, active in all the spaces, but just to follow and to be able to follow the the processes. Uh, Judith, you are here again. Yeah, I just moved uh, up to my office because I think I might have stronger internet here. Can you hear me better now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's good. Thanks. Perfect. Okay, sorry about that. Um, in terms of success, it's very difficult, I would say, to evaluate any one single element Sometimes with advocacy, you see the results 10 years down the road. Advocacy, sometimes you have a huge, big win, but that's extremely rare. Most of the time, it's like drip, drip, drip over a period of many years, and suddenly you see things happening and being included. So I can't give you a one single factor, but I know that some things that I've been advocating for for years are starting to take shape. For example, we have just managed to get a United Nations General Assembly resolution in support of social and solidarity economy. And I remember in 2012 being a meet in a meeting where I spoke about social solidarity economy and people said, what's that? So, you know, I can't give you any one single glorious victory at European level, but I think that collectively the food sovereignty movement has built credibility over the last 15 years and we are taken seriously. And certainly urgency is taken seriously in its national networks at national level at you, within Europe. And I think that is very important. And do you think in some extent um, doing advocacy at the European level uh, help to grow uh, the CSA movement as a movement and both like feeds, uh, like dynamics. 
Yeah, if I get, uh, you want to? No, go on, Isa, go on. <laughs> no, only that, yeah. Um, no, I I think that, of course, it has been to, it, it has to be a uh, two process, no? Uh, two ways uh, from, <laughs> from the local to European or the international level and and, and the challenge sometimes is to is the contrary <laughs> way because uh, to how to communicate and how to make I don't know understandable uh, for our people uh, who are working every day maybe within our groups or in a local shop uh, what are we doing in Brussels or in in other uh, spaces no but for me the um, sometimes of course the the advocacy work is the super school for resistance of frustration is the super school for that if you need it is the perfect space for for develop uh, the the resistance of uh, frustration, but uh, I think um, sometimes the the good result, of course, maybe uh, if we focus on we are uh, fighting for I don't know uh, a good cap for everybody, for, uh, success. Mm, we are not I don't know we cannot celebrate a lot, but. I think the processes are really, really uh, interesting and we learn a lot and we uh, know um, other movements, we articulate among us for other processes and also we we create also our, and I think we learn that it's important to, to be not only reactive, also proactive, because sometimes uh, following these processes <laughs> requires a lot of energy, and we are all always responding. No, uh, okay, now we have this draft, and we have to send uh, uh, comments, and we send the comments, and they are accepted or not. We send the comments again, and we are always in this loop no but this uh, but i think we we've learned that we need also to to say okay we have to respond but what do we want what do we need and what will be our how to say our ideal uh, document and if we um, at the end of the process if we i don't know if we have a, a a end, an end, a real end, because we have always another one. But uh, if we don't get the result that we wanted in official uh, documents, we should have our own document because it's a result for us to keep working and to go at the local level and sharing and and share it with our people and to feed it with the people. And to yeah, and it's super super necessary for uh, for keep go working, no. So for me, yeah. So if we analyze the victories on <laughs> on public policies and the productivity part, of course, um, yeah, they win. <laughs> but uh, I think we that is what Judy said before uh, we are creating a movement and i think from yeah when i as we said we have been for years here and and you see how we are more and more people but also the discussions that we are having are not the same we are uh, going forward we are creating our networks and we are creating other spaces and 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 I, I'm sorry for repeat <laughs> the same all the time, but uh, we are not very we, we are becoming not very visible, but we are starting to be visible uh, at least no. And maybe it's hard to say, but the crisis uh, sometimes are helping us uh, in uh, on this no, uh, because sometimes people realize that we exist when when crisis um, arrive and but is when also the the system is trying to to put us in a uh, yeah in a hidden uh, part of the 
of the I don't know of the table, no. So I think yeah, but not a lot of parties, but we can celebrate that. <laughs> so could I could I maybe give a very concrete example? Yeah, sure. Um, during the COVID crisis, CSA really exploded. There's also the cost of living crisis, which means that people are genuinely really going hungry now. Miramap has done a huge amount of work on something that they call the Sécurité Sociale Alimentaire, which in English translates into food safety net, which is to, to ensure that there is part of the social protection, the food becomes part of the social protection network. Now, this demand by Miramap was included in the urgency report on COVID on resilience. This year, the International Labour Organization Conference, the ILO, is going to be on decent work and social protection. I'm in the process of writing a short article to present the Sécurité Sociale Alimentaire, the food safety net. And I will try through the trade unions that RIPES is working with to get mention in the ILO conference documents of the food safety net taking the history in Brazil of the Bolsa Familial into account. So that is a really concrete example of advocacy based on real needs that are out there because the food banks are just feeding people with industrial food and we need alternative solutions. People need to be more empowered. I can't go into that right now, but there is an opening. I don't know if I will succeed, but it is what I'm putting a lot of energy into. And I've just come back from Africa, from the Global Social Economy, Social and Solidarity Economy Forum, which is the Forum of Cities, where together RIPES, with me representing urgency within RIPES, and a Belgian social movement and the Dakar Confederation, well, the Senegalese Confederation of Trade Unions, presented a workshop and included this concept. So again, you know, it's a slow grind and drip, 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 and maybe we'll get some kind of an outcome there. Okay, thank you very much. Would you like to add something before we leave the floor to the party to participants? Yeah, uh, because I saw one question in the chat that's about the yeah. strategies to maintain energy <laughs> within uh, uh, alliances and within our people. I think that well, it's difficult because you know they have this frustration, but. I think during the last years and with, for me, with the uh, link with feminist perspective and other perspective, I think that we include the cares as a task and because we cannot have uh, good movements and uh, how to say strong movements if our people is not being, um, uh, yeah, if we do, if we are not, uh, yeah, take care of ourselves, and um, I think that it, this is being include including, and this is something that I have to say that uh, we do in urgency. Maybe not uh, we we can do it better, but we try always to to take care of the people and to include in all our uh, meetings, even in the international committee, or uh, we start with good news. We try to, <laughs> to start with a round of good news. And if we search, we always find something. And um, yeah, but I think that the, yeah, the, the cares as a task that we need to, to include in our work is very important. No, not, is we are not only here for, to produce documents. We are here to, to create networks 
and to <laughs> to be happy also <laughs> it's difficult when we are in these loops uh, but we need to have the spaces to to be to really be and share uh, our lives no so i think this this is important too. we are not all only talking about the how to produce documents and to we cannot change the world if we are burned so okay i think um i would like to know if it resonates uh the um, aspect of taking care of each other to begin with uh, like I'm asking to other participants, do do you feel it's um it's really like uh, yeah it's a lot of energy to change uh public policy at the European level? So do you have experiences and how does it resonate for you? Uh, and if you have experiences, um, but maybe you don't. <laughs> don't be shy. <laughs> It's really a discussion. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, hi everyone. Thanks for the nice discussion, really interesting. I think for me to first, I, I, I'm just arrived in Brussels uh, and I'm just starting to understand, I would say all the processes and, um ways of how things work here so i think that's for me the first step to uh, maybe after that i will be i need more motivation but for me that's new now a motivation to start understanding uh, all these different uh, frameworks and laws and consultations and yeah it's just very complex if you haven't really been in there for for a while so i think that's uh, a first step i don't know that's my experience i don't know for other people is that Angelit? Would you like to react? Yeah. I've been trying to, to work with Brussels for a fair few years. I still have trouble understanding some things. I have a moderate grasp of some of it, but the big issue is for us as urgency that we do not have a Brussels-based person. And what happens in the Brussels bubble stays in the Brussels bubble. And if you aren't there physically all the time, you can't go to this meeting and that meeting and this thing and that thing. You cannot follow the processes in a dedicated way. You just fly in, fly out on Zoom or whatever. But I find Brussels infinitely more complex and complicated than Rome. Yeah, I actually, when we have been preparing <laughs> this model, uh, we the main, the first goal that we tried to have it was to, to uh, that the, the participants can have a, a picture of the, Brussels uh, bubble, but uh, it's impossible to to know, especially because we are not, as Judy said, we are not super experts on it. Uh, we will have the second, is why we will have the second live session with people that are uh, more involved in these processes. Uh, but I think it's super complex. And I think, I suppose that as in, in other, uh, com because yeah, uh, Brussels is, I think I agree um, that is more complex than, than Rome, but also we spend a lot of time in Rome and and we know that it's not easy. Um, <laughs> but, uh, oh, sorry, I lost what I wanted to say. Um, no, the point is that we, I think that, I don't know, I suppose that even in, in Brussels, and I, is this a question, if our people like Ilsa that is, is uh, are there, um, that you need to select, uh, because I suppose that if you go into the bubble, <laughs> you can be, it's the same in Rome. Uh, at sometimes you have to say, okay, okay, I am only one person or two people or uh, whatever and uh, 24 hours so <laughs> uh, yeah again the, the curves uh, are important in, on this and sometimes it's super difficult because the 
the the loop of of these discussions processes uh, meetings are insane no and uh, as social movement and of course these processes are designed by people that um, um structures that have a lot of people working on 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 them and we have not sometimes we we have not the capacity to to follow everything no so i think sometimes the challenge within our own movements is how to select or how to decide Okay, I can go to this, and I can't go, or is yeah, where is the balance, no? Or yeah, I think it's difficult. Yeah. Someone else. Oh, I, I just sorry, want, sorry, I just wanted to add. No, okay. Uh, no, sorry. Okay. Go ahead if you want. Please go ahead, Charlotte. Okay. Hello, everybody. I'm Charlotte, and I joined like. I'm still a student. I uh, participate to this course because was interested in learning more about these processes too. And I did my internship uh, a few months ago with the European Coordination Via Campesina, so in Brussels. And so I don't know what you say, Isa, because um, it's a very interesting movement because uh, like it's a direct uh, participation of peasants that participate in the policies in the process and it's very very hard as you said because uh, for this kind of movements with peasants small-scale farmers there are small capacities and the voice usually is not heard um, with the you know the through the commissioners or in the commission parliament etc and that's why it's very hard to have the victories very very small victories but it's just because some other organizations have a bit big capacity so many people working on it big voice and uh, yeah that's why there is a lot of work to do there is we have to make a lot of allies but yeah 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 i agree it's, it's uh, very difficult at the beginning to understand everything and to keep being updated etc but it worth it i think you're absolutely right and i think the other thing that we need to bear in mind is that the agri-food business has huge amounts of money to pour into advocating and whining and dining people and you know it's not necessarily possible for social movements to make sure their voice is heard I think we're in a much better position of influence regarding the European Economic and Social Council where there is a member of ECVC who is part of the European Economic and Social Council and where we have other allies. But that is, I won't say it's peanuts, it is important, but compared with the weight of the commission, it's not the same. Yeah, and I think that the, the point is that we are social movements and uh, the, um, how to say, the corporations or the businesses uh, have staff, uh, have the voices of their staff and a lot of staff, but we don't want, of course, we need staff and we need staff to follow and to, to support the organizations. But for example, La Via Campesina, uh, needs the voices of peasants in Brussels also, no, not only the the staff. Or in our case, uh, uh, but in in our case is easier because we are consumer and farmers, uh, so we of course our staff can be the a, a consumer and part of CSA, no. But for example, for farmers, it's not easy because if you want to make visible and to hear the voices of of the the yeah the protagonist of the <laughs> the point uh it's impossible to to follow the the processes uh by farmers uh, like uh, the corporation no so the yeah but but it's because the the processes are not designed from a human perspective because are not human uh in brussels or in rome and anywhere are not human you you spend many many hours uh, in a building 
running away uh, from one space to the other, sometimes without any window. So, uh, and you need <laughs> sunlight. It's not a joke. It's real. In, in Rome, sometimes you, you are all the day without uh, a window. So, because the, the rooms are, are uh, closed. So, it's, it's, are not human spaces, no? And, and this is a, and this is a challenge for us also, no? How can we, maintain our human perspective <laughs> within these uh, human spaces no and and i think it's the, really important no because it's for it's dangerous to to go into the loop and to and yeah not realize that uh, it's not a human space uh yeah and what i, I can see is that um we need to articulate, so I'm really saying what you just said, uh, Isa, but we need to articulate the scale of intervention. In, so um, where are we relevant within the processes of a new legislation, for example? So there is the scale. There is, um, first, we need what are our shared values as a network, and then with our allies, and then how we work together, meaning as human, like you said, and as organization and in different spaces within Europe, for example. So it's always really dynamic and we can find like sometime a recipe and then the day, the year, the year after that, it won't work because it's really dynamic and it's always moving. So that is why it's really difficult to always to tr always articulating these uh, factors uh, together um implies to be really flexible um i don't know would you like to react to other uh aspects we mentioned during the 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 the, the session at the beginning we worked we talked about the um, food systems and how eu institutions have an impact would you like to react on that um like to have more do you have more questions like uh, do you have a reaction to what has been said? No, no reaction. Okay, and then we then we we talked about the cap and as a as a tool. Do you would you like to react or to ask more question? Um, and we said about how the cap work together and how it was hard to change it. Would you like to have some? Do you have some reaction on that? No. Yeah. Lisa? Yeah, maybe I have a question. How how will or how could the cap relate to the this sustainable food systems law? In a way, how do they connect or interfere or overlap? Or for me, that's a bit hard to estimate. I, I can try, <laughs> but uh, Isa, if you know, okay. Uh, I think at this stage, it it's not really the door there there is no articulation um because the ref, the reform of the pack is done and so the next uh, uh, sorry cap sorry and the next next cap will be on 2027 so at this stage um the cap is finished i mean it's 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 written and it's uh, implemented uh, in every con european country and for the next the law, um, I don't know. So if someone knows better than me. Uh... No, it's supposed that <clears throat> it's supposed that the, um, the food system law should be uh, at the end of this year. But uh, last week I I got some news that uh, it won't happen. Uh, that uh, <laughs> officially it will because it's in the planning and it's supposed that um, this must uh, be at the end of this year or beginning of the next year. Maybe somebody has more information than me, but uh, the last news, uh, informal news, is that the um, some states are are want to to block it and uh, and. Uh, so yeah, and I think now th th the point is that the the food system law is not super transformative, but it's good 
is not bad for us. Uh, can be a, uh, an interesting tool. And as uh, Judith said before, there were uh, many objections with the, with the excuse of uh, Ukrainian, the war in Ukrainian, you know, uh, of course, people in Brussels know this better than us. And, but it's supposed that the full system law will be um, done, but uh, last week, uh, some people that is very good informed, I think, uh, were saying that uh, there are, um, yeah, there is a lot of pressure uh, uh, to block it. So I don't know. This is the the point. In the anyway, in the model, <laughs> we put all the information that we have within the farm to fork and the food system law and I, how we see it now and all the information that we could uh, find but uh is the last uh last news i say that uh, it will be difficult so we have to be of course we will be uh there to because we need it happening but uh, let's see maybe we maybe you have uh, some of you have more more information than that than... yeah i can just react to that uh, it was a relevant question and it's like a really it's a general critique that there is a lack of integrative approach of food law at the european level and for example when the cap during the negotiation of the cap uh, between 2018 and 2022 uh, there was there were um, elections european election so there were a project with a Green New Deal and the beginning of the reform of the CAP didn't take into account the Green New Deal and then they needed to change and to try to articulate both of the processes, both processes. So it's always a problem to have integrative approach between policies. So it's a, like a broad critique. I, I agree with that, Ariane, because the European system still works on a silo basis. There is no communication really between any of the legislation or not much between the DG health, between DG agriculture and the social dimensions. Um, the, there is now a law on social economy and there's absolutely no mention in spite of my advocating for a connection with the sustainable food systems so that we still have these damn silos in Europe and unless they get broken down and unless there is much more holistic cross-cutting approach we're still stuck in the same rut. Anything else on, on GAP? The <laughs> really difficult uh, topic, but we can try to answer. <laughs> no, I think that anything that requires a holistic approach is a problem here because, uh, yeah, there is. Yeah, this perspective is not uh, happening. Yeah, I think we 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 cross the questions. Um, would like to ask questions to our to our uh, participants, uh, Isa and Judith, and Sam, or like or all the participants would like to, to ask questions to each other. I mean, it's a discussion, so it's an open discussion, so don't hesitate. Okay, <laughs> so yeah, Sam okay. can like um, say that uh, for the other webinar, um, the idea is to present like strategies uh, of other organization to to uh, on on like food um and food system sorry strategies campaign and strategy and advocacy on food system and food processes so um we'll have two intervention uh one from uh, uh Spain and the other from Brussels and they will explain and unwrap uh, their strategies and so we they will uh, they will share um how it works uh, at European level and in a, at a, the national scale. 
So we will have example and we, you could ask questions on this, those strategies. Uh, I think there is a question from Priscilla. I don't know, Judith, if you want yeah. to. I think it's worked very well, Priscilla, because anything that we've input has been brought forward by the people we've been working with collectively. So I have n very little um, criticism there, but no, it's not like the CISPM because it's not just social movements, it is also a lot of NGOs and the social movements need to be prioritized within the food policy coalition, which the leaders of each theme try to do. Um, I think my closing thoughts are really the power of stories that the things that we succeed in doing are usually at territorial or local or national level. And I think we need to keep telling the stories of what works as well as advocating on the basis of those successes. And I think that's true at all levels, whether it's internationally or at European level or even at local level. I think that showing through example of what actually has worked, does work, and can continue to work is probably one of the most powerful ways of moving forward. That's all I have to say. That's it, folks, for me. Thank you very much, Judith, and uh, Isa and Sam. Yeah, if <laughs> I, I don't see more questions, um, not specifically about this, but uh, now Priscilla um, mentioned the CSI, um, CS, sorry, <laughs> uh, CSIPM in, in Rome. Um, and uh, now I remember something that I, I wanted to, to explain because we have been, I think it's good to, to share also how is the, um, attitude of European Union in global spaces also no? because is uh, because uh, at European at European level we have different states we can advocate with different states but uh, for example in the in the CFS the committee of food security uh, you, you have the European Union and of course you you can talk to to the states but they have one voice and they have to agree and it's super difficult and they and their way to proceed is okay. Sometimes they they help us because they still uh, talk about human rights, and <laughs> sometimes not always. Um, and uh, you can find some spaces to to work together in different uh, issues. But uh, the um, how to say the general behavior is that they say yes to not to everything but to a lot of things to us but then when we start to to have the discussion and to to have huge um i don't know discussions with other uh, states out of a uh, european union they uh, they don't want huge problems so they leave us alone many times so uh, they start uh, well but at the end of course they help a lot uh, in some issues but uh, yeah they say they are really diplomatic I, I can say but uh, yeah they have but I we, we know that the, within the European Union one voice are different interests and we have for example France and we have um, Hungary or we have uh, I don't know uh, yeah, so it's, it's difficult also. I, I know that uh, no, I don't want to be very kind with them, but they have their problems. But uh, but yeah, they, they, they say yes. They, they want, sometimes are people that want to help us in this global 
spaces, but yeah, not always easy, but are the, I think are the diplomatic part of the, <laughs> of the global space. I don't know, Judith, maybe you, I don't know if you agree, but this is my experience in different processes. Um, again, it comes down to the individual a lot, I think. Because what Ireland will say in Rome is not the same as what they will say through the European Union. It's 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 not easy. You you try and use your influence where you can, as you can, and how you can. But there is no alignment between what the states, that the member states of the European Union say in Rome and what they say in Brussels. That is for sure. And it's a pity because in some way, actually it's, it's, it can be good because sometimes you can take something positive that was said by a state in Rome and bring it to Brussels. But there is no general hard and fast rule. The briefing is that is insane. <laughs> Trying to advocate can be insane, Isa.